Hello and welcome back. I'm going to talk about the display you can see here in a moment, but first, a story. Today I thought I'd get this organic LED display connected to a microcontroller that I'm using for some projects, but unfortunately I've had no luck getting anything on the screen. Right now I've got no idea if the display works or not, nor do I have any known good code to test driving it with. An added difficulty is that this display, like many others of its type, does not have bidirectional communications. That is, I can send data to it, but I can't read back its state. This makes debugging things a little more difficult, at least in SPI mode. You can, however, read back data in either of the two parallel bus modes. No big deal, I thought. I'll buy a spare display, uh, just in case I've done something awful to this one. And, well, I thought wrong. Sadly, they aren't being shipped to the UK by Mauser anymore and have doubled in price even on eBay, so getting a spare one is not an option right now. Which brings us to the subject of this video. I decided it might be best to take a break from this display, go back to basics and write some code to drive a similar display. The idea is that at least I will know that my SPI code works, which should help with de debugging when I revisit the OLED display in future, this one. I don't have any spare SPI displays, but I do have this great little component tester kit that I built some time ago. I'll just focus down on that. It's using some sort of serial communication to communicate with the display, judging by the relatively small number of pins, possibly SPI, perhaps I squared C or something else altogether. This video will show you the process I use when working out how to drive an unknown display panel. In this case, there are no markings on it, to aid with identification whatsoever. I'm going to use a few things in this video, namely my multimeter, this cheap Saley Logic Logic Analyzer clone, um, a plug-in board and some jumper cables, uh, so like DuPont style connectors. I don't like them very much but they do work. Um, my component tester kit and um, lastly my Arduino Mega 2560 clone which I shall be using for the microcontroller. Uh, I'll also be using some software called PulseView to drive the, the logic analyzer. I don't know the pinout of the display but I can make a few guesses as to the pins on the header here so I'm just going to um, quickly sketch what I think is going on here and verify that with my multimeter which I have here. I shall put into continuity mode. There's the beep and um, let's have a look at what's going on. I'm just going to zoom down on the board. So what have we got going on here? Um, we have ground, and that's going to connect to, let's try and get a connection on that, uh, to something around this voltage regulator here, not the tab, ah, this pin here, um, and it probably connects to much of the rest of the circuitry up here by the display ribbon. So it's connected to more than one of the pins here and over here. This is probably ground. Um, the next pin over, I'm going to guess, is probably the supply voltage. And there we go. Uh, you could verify that by looking up the data sheet for this chip here. Um, the remaining pins appear to be connected to the uh, hex, uh, hex non-inverting buffer chip here. And uh, so what uh, I imagine we've got is basically a bunch of connections straight through here to the ribbon connector. Um, lastly, I can see there's a resistor floating around here, which I'm guessing is probably for the LED backlight. So let's just see if that's connected to anything. It's not ground. Ah, there we go. It's connected to this pin here. That's ground on the other side. So that's probably the backlight drive. Uh, so we're looking at, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five pins being connected to the, the logic of the display here. I'm just going to doodle this out now so you can see what I mean. So 
So I think what we're looking at here is we've got the display header, which has eight pins. And we've got this pin, which is connected to ground. I'm drawing this the way up that the board is laying at the moment, so it'd be upside down if you flipped it. You have positive supply, um, that's going to a voltage regulator, 3.3 volt one, which will also be connected to ground. And then the supply onwards, uh, you can actually see it on the board, runs up to the display and to the buffer chip. So that's providing plus 3.3 .3 volt rail. And then we have the LCD, which I shall just draw over here. So that's connected to the 3.3 .3 volts. And there's the, the buffer IC, which I shall draw in here. That's also connected to the 3.3 .3 volt supply. And they are also both connected to ground. So what we've got here then is the backlight. Which is connected through to the panel. And uh, then we have the remaining pins which are connected to the, the buffer IC. And I've verified all this already, but uh, There are the five pins, and each one of these has a little... Oh, I've drawn those wrong, they're not inverting. Um, so then... And then those are just connected to the display. So, um, so this is essentially what's going to be on this board. Um, I haven't specifically kept track of which pin is which here, um, just for the sake of clarity. Um, if you needed to know, you can find out with a multimeter or by following the traces. For example, you can either trace the traces from the pins to the chip, or you can check with a multimeter for more difficult ones, like for example, this one that comes out from just under the chip here. I've scratched a little bit of the solder resist off and I can now get a contact on there and figure out which pins it connects to on the chip and the display ribbon. Uh, in principle, there's no, nothing stopping me from simply going along each pin on the chip and trying to find it the same way. It's just can be a little more time consuming. And now it doesn't work anymore. There we go. So there we go. So we now know that we have ground backlight and the rest of these here are the bus interface. So at this point it's time to wire up the logic analyzer and see what's going on. It's worth noting that these buffers here are unidirectional so at this point I'm fairly confident this display is not only write only in common with most other displays of its type, but it also, it's a big hint that it's not an I squared C display because the I squared C bus normally has pull up resistors um, tying it to the positive rail. And there's none of those here. 
additionally, there's no way for this display to, for example, pull the clock line low if it's needing some more time to do things, as I2C devices often do. It can't be done. These buffers won't allow it. So this is almost certainly a SPI display. As you can see, I've um, connected this little pin header with the logic analyzer ribbon connected to it here. I've skipped the um, the positive supply pin. I don't think we need to monitor that. Um, and the logic analyzer is here, ready to go. So the next step is to fire up PulseView and see if we can get some traces from this. This is PulseView. It's the software which I'm using to control my logic analyzer. In order to capture the communications being used with the display, I need to monitor the state of the pins on the display over time. Once data is captured, I can try and decode the data on the bus, and hopefully I can at least identify the controller chip being used. Here's an example capture. After the kit's powered on, there's a brief bit of activity, followed by a pause, and then much more activity here, another pause, more activity. So there's a lot going on. Let's take a closer look. Here we can see that first bit of activity. The most striking thing, to me anyway, is the eight pulses here. Uh, my guess is this is likely to be a clock signal of some type. Below that, the next input also looks complex. Uh, it doesn't appear to be particularly regular, and to me that looks like data. This line at the top here, chip select perhaps, who knows? Um, likewise, this one, it stays low a lot. I'm not sure what that one's doing. D4 and 5 actually look like reset and backlight respectively. If we go right back to the beginning of the trace, we can see that D4 initially goes high but then dips low for a moment, which could be a reset pulse, and D5 just stays high the whole time. So my guess is backlight. Looking back at this first flurry of data here, we can see eight pulses on what I'm assuming is the clock line, and we have two pulses on what might be the data line here. Uh, I can manually decode that, and I can see that would be zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. And it just so happens that both the, the rising and the falling edge of the clock signal here um, coincide with this signal being high, so there's nothing clever going on there. So this is probably the hex 11, or if the bits are the other way around, it could be hex 88. Uh, we're not sure. Let's take a look at this data block further on, and we can see actually something else happens here on, on D3. If we zoom in, Now this is starting to look a bit, little bit more complex. Um, I'm guessing D3 is probably not a chip select because it seems to be either low or high, depending on, I don't know. Um, you can see some bytes here, it's high, some it's low. Not chip select behavior, whereas D0 faithfully goes low for every single byte. That looks like a chip select to me. That leaves clock and data here. So at this point, we can have a stab at trying to decode things. And I don't mean manually like I did before. I mean using an actual decoder. Let's choose this SPI decoder here. And once I've chosen it, I have to configure it. So I'm going to tell it that the clock signal is on D1 and that the data is on D2, and I'm going to say that my chip select is on D0, but I'm just going to hold off on that for a moment. If you look at the decoded data here, this doesn't look right, and the reason for that is the decoder hasn't really got a clue where to start, so if we tell it a little more information and give it D0 as chip select, now we can see that the decoder hasn't actually started to try and decode anything until this point here, 
and actually the clock pulses don't start until this point here. So now the decoder has made a much more sensible attempt at decoding this particular bit of data here. So now that we can see what's on the bus a little more clearly, I can make, I think I can make some educated guesses to what D3 is actually doing. Many of these small displays have a separate pin which selects whether data being transferred is a command or a data byte. Looking at this trace, I can see that there are lots of places where the line is low for just one byte period. So here at the start, here, 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 and so on. If I assume that's the case, then it looks like the display is being sent a series of one byte commands. So starting with the hex one one that we saw earlier, we then have two six, B1, C0, C1, um, C5. So there's a bit of a pattern um, perhaps to these bits. There's an additional sign here that this is not a I squared C display. And that is that in I squared C displays, you would see the address on the bus of the chip. And we're not really seeing that. There's a hex 11 back there. There's a hex 26 at the start of this block of transferred bytes. And the next block here starts with 2A, so it doesn't look like we're addressing a chip with a fixed address here, which is what you'd expect for I squared C. Um, so again, that points to SPI, even if the electrical connections didn't already tell us that. So I'm just going to finish labeling the lines here. I'm going to label this one. This is purely for my own amusement as well. Uh, the, the decoder doesn't care in the slightest. This will be chip select. I'm writing NCS because it's active low. This line is going to be clock. Data. Now the D3 pin I'm going to label D slash C because that's how it is commonly labeled on this type of display, assuming that's what it's doing. Um, D4 is reset. And D5 as backlight. So the, the reset's a bit of a guess, but it looks plausible. I'm just going to go with that for now. At this point, I've actually got enough information to take a stab at getting the display working in my own circuit, but I'd like to know a little bit for, more first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these bytes and I'm going to enter a few of them into Google. And with a little searching, I found this data sheet. Here you can see the data sheet lists several commands. Um, here's 11 hex, sleep out and booster on, which looks promising for some sort of power enabling command. And then the later commands we saw before the um, the frame data write being written. We have 2A, which is column address set, 2B, which is row address set, and 2C, which is memory write, respectively. Armed with the logic analyzer output and this data sheet, I'm going to write some code for my Arduino Mega 2560 clone, and the example code is going to be written using the Arduino IDE. I'm purposely not going to be using the built-in functions of the Arduino IDE for this, because apart from some delay functions, I want to show this code how it might be written from the ground up. With that being said, I'm not going to go into any great detail about how the code works here either, as what I'm really trying to show is the method by which I'm going to get the display to function, rather than how I wrote the software. The code will be available in Git, see the link in the description if you're interested. I'm going to connect the display like this. Focus on that. So pretty much just straight wired. Um, I'm going to be using the SPI interface on pins 51 and 52, and I'm going to be using two general purpose IO lines on pins 38 and 39. The displays reset line, I'm going to connect to the Arduino's reset line and hope that does the trick. Uh, the backlight will be permanently on and the only other two connections are power and ground. So it couldn't really be any simpler to connect this up. Um, this would be harder if the display was 3.3 um, volt only, because I would have to put a level shifter in line with it. But in this case, we're, we're good. 
and that results in something like this. It's fairly straightforward, there's no extra components, and I've still got the display plugged into the plug board here so that we can plug the logic analyzer in later if necessary. Um, I've simply connected the backlight directly to 5 volts here. And it doesn't work. The display is on, well the backlight is on. Uh, beyond that, I know nothing at the moment, so all I can do at this point now is plug the logic analyzer in and see what's going on. Okay, I've got the display hooked up to my logic analyzer and I'm going to take a trace to see what's going on. So I'm going to hold the reset button, run the trace and release. And here you can see we've got the end of the reset pulse here and then two flurries of commands. Uh, the first of which is, as before, 1-1 one, one hex. Looks a little bit different because the line started out high here, but because the clock pulse is here, that's been ignored by the display, hopefully. And we can see it's going to be 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So that's the same as before. It looks a little different, but because of the way the clock pulses and the data pulses line up, the decode is the same either way. Um, the other difference here is that this D slash C line is actually allowed to go high again in my code. So maybe that's a difference which is preventing it from working, but I suspect not. Then later, we have hopefully a very similar pattern of bytes to before. There we go. 26, B1, C0, C1, C5, and so on. 2A, 2B, and uh, no 2C. I must have missed that off, so I'll try adding that. Um, so I'm going to try and see if I can figure out why this isn't working now. And I will be back in a moment. Okay, I've made some modifications to the code. Let's see if it works now. Haha! So, what's changed? Let's do a trace on the logic analyzer. And we can see what's different. So it looks very similar, but as you can see at the end of the trace, I've snuck in hex 29, which I discovered by reading the data sheet is a display on command. Uh, this probably was in the output from the, uh, the component tester kit, but it was so far along the line that we missed it in our initial logic analyzer traces. So sometimes a little bit of sleuthing in the data sheet can pay off. And as you can see, the display is now actually displaying something. Uh, it looks like random noise, so it's probably just whatever was in the display's internal memory at reset time. So the next step is to see if we can actually send it some data to display. It works. So what changed? I've added the final command that we sniffed from the component tester. That was um, 2C hex, uh, which means, according to the data sheet, memory write. And here we go. It works. Uh, all I've done after that is just simply written a series of bytes to the display. And that's what seems to be appearing on the screen. Uh, at the end of the frame of data, I've uh, just simply repeated the process, but slightly offset from before. All of this is in the, the code, which is um, in the link below. I'm going to run a logic analyzer trace on this now so that we can see what's going on on the bus now that it appears to be working. So I shall just restart this trace. And now we can see that we've got a fairly sensible looking sequence of events going along here, but not the same as before. Before, the chip select line was going up and down a lot. I've discovered that this display doesn't actually care if you put the chip select sign up and down for every byte. So although I'm still doing it here, where I'm writing commands to the display, as you can see, it's going up and down for every byte there. During the write of the data to the display, it's left always low. And as you can see, the SPI um, decoder has tran has translated this as a single transfer of many, many bytes, rather than a series of individual bytes 
as you can see here. This is quite nice because it means we can actually send data to the display a little quicker than, uh, than was being done before. We don't have to wait for the chip select line to go up and down between every byte. And uh, I presume this is probably how the display is intended to be used, but the, whoever wrote the code for the component tester, it didn't matter. They weren't after speed. So what they've done is entirely fine. So the next step is to um, obviously refine the code a little more. I can remove probably the rest of those chip select uh, pulses there. It won't make a lot of difference to performance because the commands are only sent very infrequently, whereas data is sent in large bulk. And um, maybe we can turn up the clock speed of the SPI bus and see if the display will display a little faster. As you can see, the frame rate is pretty poor at the moment. We're getting about one about half a frame a second maybe so I'm going to try that and see what happens and here is the result of that um, I can't show you a logic analyzer trace for this now because actually the SPI clock is fast enough that my logic analyzer just simply can't record it but as you can see the display is moving at a significantly higher frame rate it's not high by any standard it's doing about 11 frames per second but that's quite usable. There's also no reason why you have to write to the display in 16-bits um, per pixel color depth. You could write in a smaller color depth, a lower color depth, and that would be faster. And neither do I have to update the entire display all the time. I do for this pattern, but um, if you were just writing text on the display, um, you could just redraw the part of the display where the text is. Uh, all that will have to be figured out at some point. The display is capable of doing that, but um, I would have to figure out the command sequences to send it to move its cursor around and set where it's going to actually write to the memory. But in principle, everything's there. It, the display is clearly working, and from this point on, it's just a matter of writing code to draw things on it. So... Um, that brings this video to an end, and I thought I'd mention a few caveats. My Arduino clone has a crystal oscillator on it, which it wasn't using. Um, I had to reflash it in order to make that work, so beware of the hazards of buying cheap copies of things like this. Um, and my logic analyzer had a dry solder joint on one of the pins. Coincidentally, the cabling that came with it had a faulty connection on the same pin, which made that quite entertaining to troubleshoot. And uh, lastly, a word on the display itself. I still don't know if this is the display that that data sheet covers. I may never know. What we're really doing is copying the work that whoever wrote the component tester code used, and that may or may not be correct. This could be the wrong way to drive this display. It clearly works, but maybe it uh, will cause damage over the longer term, perhaps even, but I think that's a bit unlikely. Uh, so this is great for you know hobby projects and so on, but obviously if you're going to do anything serious, you need to find a display that you can actually get a data sheet for that you know belongs with the display and drive it properly. That brings this to an end. If you like this video, then please um, free to like and subscribe. I much appreciate it. Um, or if you think I've missed anything out, then please do uh, comment below. So long and thanks for watching.